When I was 14 and still dipping my toes into disability advocacy and awareness, I competed with a speech about mitochondrial disease, which is my diagnosis. I was so excited to share this subject because I believed the impact it would have if people just knew more about my diagnosis. And yet, despite all of that work that I put in and all of the statistics, I consistently got comments primarily from white women about why should they care? How does this impact them? And they were trying to teach me that I needed to paint this pretty picture of tragedy in order to engage my audience. But this is just one of the many lies that white advocacy tells other advocates that we have to do. And these are standards that I upheld for myself and I upheld for other people and expected of other people. And it is so damaging and terrifying. White supremacy is the greatest threat to disability advocacy. And as white advocates, it is our responsibility to deconstruct the lies that we tell ourselves. If you're new here, my name is Isa and I'm a disabled writer and advocate. I have my master's in communication studies with a focus in disability culture and identity and this fall I'll be starting my PhD to continue my education. I have had so many bad takes over the course of my life and it has truly only been thanks to people who should not have had to be as patient as they were with me, um, black, indigenous, people of color, primarily black women who have taught me so much and improved and enriched and just transformed my disability advocacy. And I, I just wish that I had gotten access to that earlier. And everything that I'm about to say in this video, none of it's new. <laughs> absolutely encourage you to take what we talk about in this video and then go find the original sources. I'll include some down below, some places, and we'll be talking about some things. But let's, let's jump into the definitions. What do I mean by white advocacy and white supremacy in disability advocacy? Well, let's start off with the definition of white supremacy. White supremacy is the social, economic, political systems that collectively enable white people to maintain power over people of other races. I'm not saying that every white person is a white supremacist. What I am saying is that if we do not deconstruct white supremacy within our advocacy, then we uphold these systems specifically built, these lessons built to maintain power of white people over people of color. In the United States, we especially experience high levels of the consequences of white supremacy. It has stripped us of our community identities. It individualizes us to the point where we can't identify or empathize with other people. And it also pressures us to assimilate to whiteness, to lose all other contexts of ourselves that is not connected to our whiteness. So what happens a lot in disability advocacy from white advocates is that we connect ourselves to whiteness. We uh, let ourselves be patronized. We let ourselves be all of these things that white supremacy does and, you know, to, to protect ourselves if we receive criticism from anybody saying that we're racist or to say that we're doing something harmful. We're like, no, 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 no. I'm just doing things in the proper ways. Like I said, this is socialized. This is stuff that we grow up with. This is the stuff that we learn. And it's, so it's our responsibility to de-learn it, to deconstruct it, to break it down and make sure that it's not impacting our advocacy. The first lie that I wanna talk about is if people just knew. I see this a lot in awareness campaigns where this idea is, well, people aren't bad, which I do agree that most people aren't bad, they just don't know things. However, it puts the pressure on the individual to educate them, to say, well, someone's not bad, they just, they don't know that they're, they're being racist, that they're being ableist. I've heard this comment a lot of like, you should just, you should educate them. You should be patient with them and you should teach them. And while it is true that education and teaching and all of these things have their place and I think they can be so beneficial, there's a lack of recognition in this lie that it should not be the standard. It should not be expected that people should go out of their way to learn about other people, that they should go out of their way to um, engage and to diversify their perspectives and to try to be a good human being and not depend on their ignorance to protect them from the consequences of their behavior. 
thing about this lie is that it isolates anger and makes it seem like this bad thing of like, well, you're just not being understanding enough because they just didn't, they didn't know, they didn't understand, they didn't think about it before, which is absolutely true, but that doesn't mean that it absolves them of their guilt, which also means it doesn't absolve you of your guilt and that it, we are all responsible for the ways that we hurt other people, ignorant or not. And so it is our responsibility that when we do hurt someone else, that we make sure that we don't do it again, that we take the learning opportunity and that we try to make it so we never have to learn something in the first place, that we use the free resources that people with disabilities, that black people, um, indigenous people, people of color from different cultures give us every single day. TikTok is such a diverse place. YouTube is such a diverse place. There's so many books and fiction and beautiful, incredible things that will teach you these concepts without you ever having to depend on the other person to correct you when you are wrong. And it keeps you both from being in that awkward position where you hurt them and they have to call you out for hurting them. This leads us to the second lie is that you are all alone or this is all new. And I just want to point out that disability can happen to anyone at any time. And so for a lot of people, especially white people, this is the first experience of marginalization you've ever had in your entire life. So it does feel all new and it does feel very isolating and alone, especially when you've heard, you know, well, people just don't understand and you need to be patient with them and you need to do these things because they've never experienced it before. Because if they didn't understand, it means they've never run into anyone like you before. The reality is, especially in the United States, is that almost all marginalization, if not all, can be traced back to white supremacy. And when white supremacy is the cause of all problems, it extends to a lot of us. And it means also is that ableism has been used as a tool for white supremacy for so long. So much of our culture and so much of our history has been focused on disabling and injuring and harming black indigenous people of color. But it also means that black indigenous people of color have been fighting this since the origin of our nation. It means that some of the most incredible disability advocates you're not getting to learn about because we don't learn black history. We don't learn the history of indigenous people. We don't learn Asian history. We don't learn specific Islander history in our schools. We have to go out and seek that information. When you do go seek out that information, you learn about the incredible advocates that have been kept from us. The biggest truth is that there's so much advocacy to learn and joy to be found in the communities that white supremacy keeps us from and you are only alone as long as you keep swallowing this lie. Next lie that I want to talk about in response to that one is that being disabled does not mean you automatically understand other people or that you were excused from the way that you are racist. There is a major patronization of disabled people, white disabled people in white spaces, similar to white women. And as long as you're upholding this innocence that you didn't know better, you can realign with whiteness and rejoin the majority society. However, when you reject that, you are no longer innocent. And black indigenous people of color have never had the privilege of being assumed innocent. They have never had the privilege of being able to be ignorant. And it is only white people that assumes that privilege. There's a big temptation to believe that because we share so much of our marginalization and discrimination that we understand each other on a same level and the same perspective, um, especially other disabled people. There's no way right now, at least in my life, that I understand what it means to be deaf. It doesn't mean that I understand what it means to have Down syndrome, but I do know what it means to be part of the disability community. And we so those are starting points of shared experience that we can then learn about other people. And that is the same case when we're talking about people who are not white. I said earlier, Earlier, it is our responsibility as white disabled people to find the generous free labor that is given to us on a daily basis to learn to listen we don't have to empathize we don't have to see how this affects us directly we don't have to see how this directs uh, directly affects someone that we know we can just listen we can hold space for the ways that we have hurt other people and deal with it on our own that's very important deal with the white fragility and the the tendency to feel offended when someone tells you that you're doing something wrong hold place for that and to deal with it without expecting other people to deal with it for you and then act in a way that has been asked of us a lie that i want to talk about is that 
disability can be separated from race, gender, class, sexuality, because it can't. It absolutely cannot. Your disability may be connected to a white person. It may be connected to a white man. It might be connected to a white woman. But understanding disability and disability advocacy to create any change, to create any long lasting change, to do things like create curb cuts, we have to understand the ways that race, gender, sexuality, and class all affect the ways that we participate in the world and the ways that other people are allowed to participate in the world. Health is the beginning and end of oppression. Health is used as a tool to control, to harm, to eradicate. In every form of oppression that is experienced across the world, there will always be a link back to disability, but you will never understand the true nuance of it if you are only looking at it from your limited perspective to disability. So how do we make things better? First of all, deal with your white guilt. Find a therapist, if you can, who is educated in nuanced perspectives to disability and oppression and justice. Also, talk to your white friends who are going through that same process. Deal with your emotions with them. Do not, please, do not put this on other people. You don't want people to come to you and have you absolve them of the guilt of the way that they have treated disabled people. So don't go around and do that same thing to the advocates, the black indigenous people of color, specifically black women who face this every single day, who have so many comments of white people trying to absolve them of their guilt. Acknowledge your privilege because that is such a big part of the way that we are perceived in the world, especially as it relates to invisible and visible disabilities. A person who is white, who has an invisible disability is still treated so differently than a black person who has an invisible disability. I have a custom wheelchair and that is related to the fact that I have insurance and that comes from a specific class that I grew up in and it's, I have been poor <laughs> most of my life, but I have had insurance to be able to pay for a wheelchair. And privilege is nuance. learn more about privilege because it is interesting and it definitely affects the ways that we are perceived in the world. It's not, as straightforward as we talk about it sometimes. The big thing you can do is learn our disability history, learn the truth of our disability history, learn how important the Black Panthers were for the 504 sit-in, learn what the 504 sit-in is, find disabled ancestors that you connect with and you can listen to and find people who are doing the work now, who have done the work, who are absolutely incredible. I love the book Care Work and so many others and I'll leave a whole bunch of suggestions down below as just starting points. They're super fantastic and I am so thankful to have them every single day. And it makes me feel not alone. Finally, we have to start working beyond disability because disability is, like I said, it's not just limited to this one experience because if you truly care about disability advocacy, if you truly care about disability justice, then you need to be aware of the things that are going on. You need to be aware of the way that health has been used as a tool for oppression and discrimination and harm and eradication seen this over and over again during COVID. We see this right now during the Palestinian genocide where people have been moved from their homes. Disabled people do not have access to the care that they need. People are becoming disabled. People are experiencing preventable illnesses because one country has decided to try to eradicate an entire group of people. The world is so much bigger and complex and nuanced than us and it is so important that we understand our role in upholding harmful ideologies and the way that we do advocacy and it's so important that we do that so that when we do advocate that we can stand in the belief that we're doing it correctly that we stand in the belief that we are going to correct when we are wrong and we stand in the belief that we are working with other people to make this world actually better for every person living in it.